This week on Burn the Boats, I am sharing one of the most extraordinary conversations I've had in a long time. Many of you know I've got a film coming out soon, Against All Enemies, about violent extremist groups in America. My guest today infiltrated these violent groups to take them down. Matt Browning served as an undercover cop in Arizona where he worked his way into white supremacist militias. His wife, Tawny, joined him, and together, at enormous risk to their own lives, they gathered evidence and built cases that put these violent extremists away. You don't want to miss this one. It's the kind of thing they make movies about. Enjoy the show. My guests today are Matt and Tawny Browning. Matt served as a detective in Arizona and spent 25 years undercover, infiltrating and eventually taking down white supremacist groups. His wife, Tawny, assisted in these investigations, accompanying him to skinhead events and gaining intel. Their book, The Hate Next Door, tells the story of their time undercover. Matt, Tawny, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having us. Uh, I, I don't come from this world of undercover intel ops, but I'm guessing that that in your line of work, a husband and wife team is pretty unusual. Yeah, I don't. That, that what's more unusual was it wasn't supposed to happen. But yeah, I mean, it's it's not very common. Tawny, how did you get? into it. I mean, Matt was the detective. This was his line of work. Uh, And at some point you decided, uh, look, he's going to need backup, right? (laughs) Well, I mean, look, he had some really great backup teams. He really did. But as this kept going and going and going, it, it started to affect the home life. And there was a lot of times, I mean, there's a lot of reasons I got into it. One was that I wanted to bring him back home. I always joke, my grandma took up fishing. I took up hate, but you know, there were some times where I just wanted him home with me and his mind was so passionately elsewhere that I kind of, you know, invested myself in what he was invested in. But what really happened on is on Christmas night, uh, one of our four H lambs was slaughtered and killed and placed on our back porch. And when my children found that I knew it, I knew hate had come home and there, there was nothing more that, I mean, there was no choice anymore. I needed to get into these guys' hearts and minds and see what was, you know, it basically invading my home as well. And how how did you do that? I mean, Matt's there at these concerts basically in the mosh pit, but you're you're really working the the crowd at an emotional level and and connecting with these folks and getting to know them, right? Yeah. And what that was kind of, you know what he, I asked Matt, how do I, we would go to these concerts and some, somehow while he was in the mosh pit and I was watching him, it kind of, it kind of just happened. And then there was one night I said, Hey, look, if I can get this information, can we go and do what I want to do? And, and I, he said, you can't get that. And I did. And it just really wasn't, I mean, it just was kind of natural. It wasn't meant to be, it just happened. But the th- Matt gave me some really, really good advice. And he said, just be you. Don't talk about anything you don't know. Don't. So when they would talk hate and ugly sometimes, parts that I didn't want to hear, I said, do we really have to talk about this? Do you guys really have to use the F word, every other word? I mean, really? And, and it just somehow worked for me. Matt, can you give us like the 30,000 foot view? Because I suspect uh, a lot of viewers are thinking about this as a really fringe and, and, and niche um, activity of these extremists when it's it's a threat that's pervasive. It's growing. Uh, it's not just in uh, a mid-sized town in Arizona. Uh, I mean, y- you have uh, tapped into something that is a real current in our culture today. Yeah, I, I think if you want to look from a thirty thousand foot view, if you're looking down and you see all the people down there. It's no different from 30,000 feet or three feet. You have no idea what you're dealing with. Um, That's why the book's called The Hate Next Door, because literally the people that you live next to, the people that you stand next to, the people that you go to church with or go to football games with, they could be members of these these, um, organizations and groups because you just don't know. You know, being a person involved in hate, It shows on their countenance. It shows in their speech. It shows in their attitudes. It shows in their the way they carry themselves. 
a person involved in, in, you know, a normal street gang, it shows in all kinds of different ways. And street gangs are easier to read. But when we're talking hate, it's the ideology, it's the rhetoric. And you put those two together it equals the violence. And it's just something that has been passed over and looked over uh, for so long because it just it affects so many different people. And in order to investigate it, you have to get into the minds of the people. You have to understand why they feel the way they feel, what happened to cause them to do the things that they're doing now. And that's why hate's really hard to work. It feels like something has changed, though, in the last few years in the way some of these hate groups have been validated and platformed. I'm thinking about the former president himself name-checking a group identified by Canada as a terrorist organization, the Proud Boys, from a presidential debate stage. I'm thinking about Nazi flags in front of Disney World. That kind of thing didn't happen when I was growing up, but something has happened to allow a, a new permission structure to uh, to bring these groups into the open in a way yeah. that they were they were reticent about uh, a generation or even a few years ago. Well, I mean, what's happened is that it, it, here's what it, in the world I hate. If you if you don't have a leader. You don't have an organization. If, if you don't have somebody who's willing to stand up and say their views and philosophies, you don't have people that are willing to stand up with you and support you in what you're doing. Um, and in the hate movement, as soon as a leader comes into play, you're going to see the whole hate scene come on a rise. The music will come back. The, the concerts comes back. The, the barbecues, the cross burnings, everything related to hate will come back into play. Only when you have a leader. And what happened was um, when when a person is running as an elected official, he's running for office, you have the base that goes right or left. You have those people and you're always trying to get more from the left to vote for the right or more from the right to vote for the left. What Trump did is it was brilliant. He went outside the right and the left and he went to the extreme right. And he brought that base out, which then added on to who was already going to vote right. And that's he won the election that way. Now what we're now what we're going to see is that he's already got that right, that extreme, but he needs to go another step further to bring out more of the extreme extreme right because he lost the last election, so he needs more numbers. Is it simply a matter of the radicalized Republican Party led by Trump identifying those extremists and bringing them into, into their coalition? Or are they further radicalizing Americans? Are their activities and is their rhetoric actually moving people to the extremes instead of just identifying the existing extremists oh, in that's, our that's, culture? That's a great question. It's an excellent question. I mean, the thing that we try to stay pretty centrist that we always have them. We're not political people, really. We lean one way or the other sometimes, but this was, this has been really difficult given that I don't even know that Trump believes what he's saying. I mean, I don't even know if he, if he buys it, but in, in the name of a vote, it's kind of scary what it's doing to our country. Yeah, so I, I think I think the more people are being radicalized by the things that are going on. If you look at like like the border issue, the, the, the immigration is a problem. We all know it's a problem, and, and we we know that something has to be done. But who's going to go the furthest extreme in what we're going to do? You know, when I was when I was doing my undercover work, I had. You know, I had a source that was at meetings where they were loading up their AR mags to go down to the border and shoot at illegal immigrants coming across the border. I worked there's seven homicides I worked of immigrants coming across the border. There's organizations from all over the United States that come down to Arizona and New Mexico and, and basically go on hunting trips to stop people from coming across the border. That's the type of radicalization that's going on because of the ideology and rhetoric that is being spewed by people who are in, in power 
And when you have a person who's already a little bit frustrated about what's going on, and then he can jump on a bandwagon and get more indoctrinated with with uh, conspiracy theories or extreme news coverage or whatever it might be, then that little seed's planted and it's just going to grow and grow until they do something stupid. Talk about that process of radicalization. I mean, there is a, a pipeline or a funnel that brings people into these organizations. You put yourself in that pipeline. You had a, a close-up view of, of the tactics uh, that these groups use to move people from extremist curious to you know a fully-fledged, right. committed member of one of these groups. How does that work? Well, the first thing you have to do, like, I'll look at it from the undercover role because that's that's how I learned how easily it is to become radicalized. Um, I went to my first meeting with the National Alliance, and I had no backstory whatsoever. And I went in, sat down, and I went, holy crap, I don't have a backstory. What if they ask me questions? So what I did is ask them questions. And then from the answers that they gave me, I was able to form my thought, my, my ideology into what's going on and create my backstory. And my backstory was I hated the Mexicans because they sold me of all my landscaping equipment and took it down to Mexico. And that was my whole backstory in the white power movement. But what happens is, is that through that, I had to keep telling myself and reminding myself and reading more about what was going on, asking more questions about the the views of the illegal immigrants in, in Arizona compared to the views of the Jews in New York, you know, because there are two different views from wherever you're at in the United States. It's all different. So the radicalization process just starts with a question. It starts with, you know, getting cut off in traffic by a car that's from Sinaloa or from Sonora, Mexico. And that because they're driving a car from Mexico in Arizona. Now I hate all Mexicans because they cut me off. Then you go down the rabbit hole of why should I hate these guys? Well, they probably don't even have freaking insurance. They don't have jobs. They're stealing all of our medical insurance. They're doing this and doing this. And next thing you know, that that sea gets bigger and bigger and bigger until the next time somebody with a Sonora plate cuts you off, you jump out and shoot at them. And, be- and that because, because of the constant... We talk, whenever I teach, I say, listen, these guys, you need to understand, they wake up in the morning hating, and they go to bed at night hating, and then they wake up in the morning and they hate, and then they feed their mind with hate, and then they go to bed with hate. They never leave the hate movement, and that's what was so hard for me as an undercover is that I was finding myself getting radicalized in that crap, and then luckily I had Tani that says, whoa. Whoa, whoa, Matt. No, no, everybody's not like that. No, that's not how it is. I love Tony's perspective on how that manifested itself. When when Matt's coming home, did you notice these changes? Well, I, I started to know, I noticed things that would happen, like he would say something and I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Because, you know, I grew up in a place called, um, on the on the west side of Phoenix, called Glendale, which is is highly Hispanic. So, I mean, I grew up, we grew up very much integrated and not purposely. We just did. And it, it was, it was great. I didn't know it, how great it was until now, but I'd say, well, what about so-and-so and so-and-so and people that I loved and adored and he knew and, or our neighbor, you know, what about Mark? You know, what about all these people? And so then you could see it almost switch. We learned later that your brain, actually, the neural pathways do change when you embrace yourself and hate that way. So it kind of makes sense. But the longer he stayed outside before he came in, the more I knew I needed to get out there and talk with him. There were some real monsters in these organizations that you tracked and gathered intel on. I want to talk about uh, a few of them, JT Reddy in particular. But were there any individuals that over time either of you developed sympathies for? Uh, yeah. Did you did you ever have that moments where you realized this person is is recoverable? Um, this person isn't rotten to their core. Well, I think um, well, I, I think Tony and I have two different perspectives on that. Tony, I'll, I'll tell you mine. I'll let Tony tell you hers. My perspective is. 
I don't care who you are, or what you've done. If if you've if you've committed a crime, then we're going to deal with it. And the people that I was undercover with, we put nineteen in Arizona alone, nineteen people in prison for murder or attempted murder. And that's just in my undercover work. That's in my cases. Now, I can tell you that there's seven unsolved murders still. There's also a, probably JT has a list of murders still. Um, there's hunting trips where there's victims of aggravated assaults and a, and a murder that I'm looking into. Still, I'm still looking into a murder that happened in the early 2000s by these guys. So I do believe in rehabilitation. I do believe that they can they can change. We just met a, a gentleman the other day who was like, I mean, we sat down. That we're we have we have a string of youth violence going on, and we have a guy that showed up that wanted to help us make a change with with the youth, and he actually knew all the guys I locked up. He was cellies with them and we were talking and laughing and, and you know what? He has changed and I believe it. He has changed. He wants to make a difference. People like that, in my opinion, are just few and far between and it's through their actions that you'll find out. Now the guys I locked up for murder. No, they're, they're not going to change. One, one has changed. And, and I know that. And we'll see what happens when it gets out. You know, this is where Matt and I differ a little bit because I know, I mean, he's been in the trenches and I need to listen to him more because he keeps us safe. But I also can see people's hearts. And I knew that when I got online and saw these guys' hearts and minds, it was completely different than I thought I was doing that to protect us. But really what I, I the joke was on me. I found that these were, some of these guys were, were good dudes. And they, I mean, good dudes, I'm not trying to say what they were doing was good, but their mom, you know, they talk about their moms and I thought about their moms and their, um, their dads. And I mean, one guy, he could really speak the King's English. And, um, I was like, why are you here? How did you get here? And some of that sucked me in and the whys made me see, oh, we're okay. I mean, you can, there is a way out. That's what I'm trying to say. There is a way out. We've seen it happen and we've seen people take that ugly, ugly and make good out of it. Matt, you referenced JT and hunting trips. Mm -hmm. Um, I think some people are going to assume that's a kind of metaphor. It's not. Can you talk Mm -hmm. about who JT was and what you mean by hunting trips? Yeah. Um, uh, I tell you what, um, I'm trying to phrase what JT was. JT was a piece of garbage, literally a piece of garbage. And when I say, I say that with all due respect, he's passed away. He had killed himself after he killed a family of five. But he he literally is the person, if you want your stereotypical, racist, radicalized, white power skinhead, that's JT Reddy. He he military trained. He was in the military, got court martialed, came to Arizona, um, radicalized himself in in the in the doctrine of hate. But what JT did is he took that and he formed a lot of different things. And and, and it is a great example because as he grew older, he also grew older in the white power movement. So he started as a skinhead. Then he moved into the political party and then he went into the border groups and then he went into the national socialist movement and then he created his own border group. And, and, and then, then he, he ran for sheriff. Then he ran for sheriff. And then he, but before sheriff, he hooked up with the Republican party in Arizona and was buddies with the Senator who, who another piece of garbage. But what JT would do was he, the, man, the guy was so full of hate. What he would do, he took his border people And they would go down to the border and they call them special ops and they would go down and they would. um, And we're not just talking going and camping on the border. I mean, these guys remember JT was military trained. They load up their ARs, they load up their shotguns, load up their handguns, tack out. So they had the vest, camo, everything on, just like you would you would think a full military, the full military garb would be. And then they go down to the border and they just sit and wait and they. They literally hunt just like you'd hunt a deer or a coyote or anything else. And they wait for illegal immigrants to come across the border. Then they shoot at them. And if they didn't, if they didn't hit them or kill them, the immigrants that they're carrying the the bags of, of marijuana or meth or anything that the coyotes are making them carry the cartels, they would drop the bags and run back 
or, or scatter. And then JT and his crew would go pick up the bags of drugs and sell the drugs and then turn half the drugs into the border patrol say, hey, look what we did for you. While they kept the other half and sold them to fund their movement. Hi, everyone. I want to give a big shout out to all those who have signed up to support this show through my Patreon page. We are off to a fantastic start. Thank you for making it possible. And if you haven't subscribed, I hope you'll consider it. In the coming months, I'll be posting early and exclusive content, including a trailer for the Against All Enemies documentary film, which has been racking up awards at film festivals around the world and will soon be released here in the U.S. Stand by for more details on that. And if you're a subscriber to my Patreon page, be on the lookout for an early preview. Thanks again, everyone. I've tried so many different things to maintain a heart-healthy lifestyle, like crash course diets or starting a daunting cardio routine, and frankly, it just hasn't been helpful for me. We often think that living a more heart-healthy life means making big, unsustainable changes. With Super Beats Heart Chews, you can get daily blood pressure support in just two tasty chews a day, and they even promote heart-healthy energy without the stimulants. Paired with a healthy lifestyle, the antioxidants in Super Beats are clinically shown to be nearly two times more effective at promoting normal blood pressure than a healthy lifestyle alone. Heart health is important for me because I want to be around as long as possible for my loved ones. Super Beats Heart Shoes give me the peace of mind that I'm doing something good for myself every day. Super Beats Heart Shoes are a convenient way to support healthy blood pressure. No pills to swallow, no ingredients to mix or prepare. It's plant-based and no artificial sweeteners or colors. I cannot recommend Super Beats Heart Shoes enough for our listeners. Double your potential with Super Beats Heart Shoes. Get a free month supply of Super Beats Heart Shoes on all bundles and a free full-size bag of turmeric chews valued at $25 with your order by going to BoatsBeats.com. Get this exclusive offer only at BoatsBeats.com. If someone would have told me that there are science-backed ingredients that could help me feel 15 years younger in a matter of months, I wouldn't have believed it. Then I tried Qualia Senolytic. As we age, everyone accumulates senescent cells in their body. Senescent cells cause symptoms of aging, such as aches and discomfort, slow workout recoveries, sluggish mental and physical energy associated with that middle age feeling also known as zombie cells. These are old and worn out and not serving a useful function for our health anymore, but they are taking up space and nutrients from our healthy cells. Much like pruning the yellowing and dead leaves off a plant, Qualia Senolytic removes those worn out senescent cells to allow for the rest of them to thrive in the body. The formula is non-GMO, vegan, gluten-free, and the ingredients are meant to complement one another, factoring in the combined effect of all the ingredients together. Qualia Senolytic has a 100-day money-back guarantee. Resist aging at the cellular level. Try Qualia Senolytic. Go to neurohacker.com slash boats for up to $100 off and use code boats at checkout for an additional 15% off. That's neurohacker.com slash boats for an extra 15% off your purchase. Thanks to Neurohacker for sponsoring today's episode. There is a so-called army of God, their term, headed down to the border. They have members at the border right now. I mean, as an aside, the direct translation of Hezbollah, a terrorist organization, is army of God. I don't right. know if this group appreciates just how crazy <laughs> they seem, but we have this happening right now. I mean, JT Reddy's been dead a while, but the kind of thing he was doing uh, is is still happening. Oh, yeah. No, JT started doing his thing in, in the mid-90s. You know, or, or in the late 90s, JT started his first border group, and then it morphed into all this other stuff until he eventually, uh, you know, he was involved in a murder-suicide. And he um, – then you have Chris Simcox with the Miniman Militia. You have all the other border groups that go down and, and station at the border – you have this whole, you know what, these guys. Well, there's Shauna they, Ford, who's on death row. Shauna Ford, who I mean, killed, she was doing the same kind of thing, trained by JT Reddy, or, you know, a part of all of that. She killed a, another man and his daughter down in Aravaca. Um, but you have the army of God coming up. And, you know what, do whatever you want to do. I really don't care. You guys do. If you think you have to do this, then do it. The problem I have with it is when you're interfering 
with what is going on. They're, they are coming across and everybody in their organization is just not a good person doing good work. That's maybe 60%, 70% of the people in the organization. The rest of the people are looking for a fight. The rest of the people are looking for who can I shoot at? The rest of the people are looking for a reason to hook on to something to go and do what they want to do. And, and that's the problem I have with it is that they're not all good people. The, the guy who founded it might be really good. You know, he just wants to make a difference somewhere. But it's all the garbage that you pick up along the way. It's, it's like driving a car down the highway. Your, your windshield's clean when you, when you leave the house. But as you get to where you're going, you got bugs splatter all over the place and you can't see. And that's what's happening in the hate movement on things like this. It starts out really good and sounds really nice. But when you get to your end goal, you can't see it because of all the crap that people are throwing at you and, and pe the people that you've picked up along the way are blocking your view. Why do you think these groups work so hard to bring in former military, law enforcement, others uh, with, with the backgrounds they have? Well, I, I can only speak from my personal experience on this. And that, and that is because of working undercover. When, when I retired, uh, a group out of New Mexico was starting to do this whole border thing. And so I was asked, you know, Matt, can you infiltrate this group? And I said, yeah, sure, I can do it. And I call them and I, and you know what, this, for whatever reason, I didn't hide who I was. I didn't use my undercover name. I didn't use any of my undercover stories. I said, yeah, I'm, I'm a retired cop. What do you need? As soon as they heard I was a retired cop, I bypassed all the training. I bypassed all the background checks. I bypassed everything. And I was then put on a special operations team that would go and do the special ops at the border. I wasn't going to be parking lot security. I was going to be part of the training. And then at night, I would go do the special ops hunting trips with the guys and sit on the side of the hill with a 50 cal and shoot at people. You know, it just sounds so crazy. No one wants to believe it's happening. I don't want to believe it's happening. I was a Disney-esque mom. I tried to create that in this home. And it's not Disneyland out there. It really is happening. It really is. And it's so shocking to the senses that we would actually shoot human beings because for sports. Yeah. I think one of the scariest aspects to a lot of people is that recruitment of, of law enforcement and going the other way, the potential infiltration of law enforcement. You talked about JT Reddy running for, for sheriff. Well, we have examples around the country of these constitutional sheriffs who reject mm -hmm. federal authority, uh, who in, in some cases are conspirators with insurrectionists, and I think that is really concerning to a lot of Americans. Well, you know, everything comes back to Arizona, man. I mean, Richard Mack, he's out of Arizona. You have uh, Stuart Rhodes. He was he, he did his time um, doing his uh, working for the Arizona Supreme Court, you know. And so Stuart Rhodes is the Oath Keepers and Richard Mack is a Constitutional Sheriff's Association. So. My whole problem with all that, I mean, again, it goes back. You want to hang out with the guys and go have a beer or talk stupid stuff? Go do it. That's great. But do not teach people that if the FBI or any federal government comes into your county, they have to report to you because you are the elected official. You are in charge. You are the man. You're going back to the original posse comitatus of views and philosophies. You're going back to the to the, all the, the haters of the 80s and 70s that started this whole thing. They were teaching the same stuff. And, and as a police officer, I take offense to it. Um, I do not support it whatsoever. Um, uh, the Oath Keepers, in my opinion, are, you know what? We saw them at, the, at January 6th, you know, winding up the staircase. We, we don't need that stuff, especially in law enforcement. How does the LEO community, which let's be honest with each other, it, it leans conservative. I'm a military mm -hmm. vet. Same can be applied to my community. But in the case of, of law enforcement, there's this real cognitive dissonance after January 6th where you saw your, your brothers in arms being beaten with yeah. flagpoles, with American flagpoles being maced 
Um, and, and yet there is this tendency now to, to defend the insurrectionists. You have members of Congress calling them hostages, some of them being called martyrs. I'm wondering, as a former police officer, how you and your buddies talk about that. Um, well, the, the, the problem is, um, we don't talk about it. Oh, wow. And that's the problem. We, we, we just, we just go on with our thing. And there's a lot of guys in law enforcement. Like when I go and teach, I always say, if I'm teaching a four hour block at the three hour mark, I say, this is the point in the class where probably some of you are going to get up and walk out. And I accept that. I, I appreciate it. So you don't stand up and yell at me. But that's when we get into the whole constitutional side and the and the oath keepers and the, the military vets and things like that. And, and sure enough, they get up and walk out. But it's, it's probably two, it, like two people usually. Yeah, two to two to three. Two, yeah. yeah. But still, that's too, too many people. Because from that two, you know, I have two in my class who then go and tell 10 at their department who then spread it to another 15 or 30 in other departments that are all looked at, linked up and hooked up with these different organizations. I personally think it's wrong. As a police officer, you have to be straight down the middle neutral because you're dealing with both left and the right and dealing with victims and things like that. And I don't think we can let our, our political views affect what we do in the, in the job. And that, and that's one thing that he does say when he teaches is look, this isn't political. These are facts. This is what, what is happening and I can back it up. And so stay with me. So it's just so hard, but there are some guys that reach out to you who says that, and those are the guys that are asking him to teach and things, you know, my guys need to know this stuff. Mm -hmm. And, and, and so I think there is hope and there is, you know, when we talk about it, then everyone can form their own opinions and ideas based on fact and information. Do you worry about how the law enforcement community will react if the next presidential election is really close or if the the losing candidate decides not to respect the results of of the election which if it's trump we've already seen he refused to accept the results of his his last loss i mean if it it comes down to um mass protests Mm -hmm. I, I worry about how law enforcement may may behave in in some areas, not everywhere, not in most places. Um, but yeah, you know, my, some of these sympathies, it's a concern. Yeah, my only my and, and I'm glad you said that word sympathies because my concerns are exactly that. Um, law enforcement is amazing. I love cops. I love our military. I support them. I get upset when people say defund or no, we need to train and we need to do more. But I also get extremely upset when I have law enforcement that um, believe more that the vote was stolen than that it was what we thought. I, I, I get upset with those people. You can't, you can't let politics run law enforcement. You, you just can't. At, at the upper levels, I understand. As a chief level, you're a politician. I get it. But when you're on the ground fighting every day, you you will divide the police department, you will divide your squads, you will divide the communities because I don't believe the same way you believe. And when you have these extreme politics going on that are sucking in the extremes, there are cops, there are military, there are good, there, there are bad people, good people, all kinds of people that are sucked into these movements. And before they know it, it just gets completely out of hand. And, um, yeah, I guess, I don't know if I answer your question, but yeah, it, it worries me. It really does. But I, I, I worry more for the guys back in DC who have to, you know, fight the crowds at the white house than, than what's going to happen in Arizona. I, I worry in Arizona about the border and the guys going down to the border. I worry back in New York and Chicago and Detroit. I worry about the hate there is geared towards the Jews and the Muslims. Um, it's all different f throughout the United States. So, yeah, I worry about it. I think we all saw it happen on January 6th. We all saw it. And I, and I actually believe in law enforcement. I don't, I, I think that, you know, when it comes right down to it, I, I think, at least I would hope they're going to do the right thing. 
Yeah. I don't believe in corrupt law enforcement. We had one of the Capitol police officers who defended the Capitol on, on January 6th on this show. I mean, extraordinary story mm-hmm. from, from an immigrant to this country who fought in Iraq uh, in, in the army, came back and had to defend <laughs> his nation's capital against fellow Americans. Um, and just, you know, a striking perspective on how, how abandoned he feels by a major political party that calls the people who attacked him hostages and martyrs. Yeah. You know what? I, I, just like everybody else, we've watched the videos and we, we've, we've done our own little research on, on everything going on there. But it always goes back to this one thing as a police officer, how in the world can I assault another police officer whether it's at the Capitol, at a gas station, at a football game, anywhere else, that, that is, to me, that is uncalled. That, that I cannot understand why law enforcement would be a part of the problem. They should have, they should have stood up, turned around, flashed the badge, got on the other side with the cops and fought against everybody else. That's what a, a cop should have done. And and it's an, it's an embarrassment. It really is an embarrassment to know that there were cops that were um, part of that. It's an embarrassment to know that the military was part of it. It's an embarrassment to know all this stuff. I, I mean, I'm looking at tattoos and T-shirts, and then it's like, whoa, those are Oath Keepers going up and doing all this crap. No, man, don't. So I, I just, yeah, I feel for those guys. I don't know. I think there's a lot of law enforcement officers that feel exactly the same too. I mean, I think that the other side may get a lot of the the press and stuff, but there are a lot of really, really good, good dudes that are in the military and in law enforcement. There just really are. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Tawny, can you talk about the weird religious elements that work their way through the, these hate groups ideologies Uh, at one point in the book uh matt talks about his credentials as a you know church going dad as as establishing him within these these hate groups as as a as, as a leader i mean it seems really like a conflict to me to have these religious themes and then these these hateful activities but they are able to weave them together you, you know, I work in the extreme and I mean, we, there's all levels of, of religious extremism, but I work on the very far, far end of extremism in some of these political um, polygamous groups that I've been blessed to be um, able to work with. And I'll tell you, I mean, some of the rhetoric, they're saying what I heard from skinheads, except for just taking it even further. Things like, hey, you know, Hitler had the right idea except for he didn't do it with the priesthood, meaning, you know, God, or I'll see some of the same kind of nationalist tattoos. You know, these are, these are obviously ones that are um, rebellious within their own religion, but it's crazy that they turn to other extremist um, symbolism and things like that. So Matt always says that if you put religion into anything, into any ideology, you supercharged it. And that is a huge um, indication for violence. So, you know, Jesus didn't teach hate. He taught love and, and that's the opposite. And so I, I wonder as humans, how we get so twisted sometimes. Yeah. That, that's a really interesting observation that if you, if you add religion, if you add this idea that we're doing God's work, it gives you permission to do just about anything. Yeah. Show me, show me any, any movement that doesn't have supposed, you know, it's said with quotes, you know, God, you have, you know, the, the, the Vikings, when they went and took over lands and stuff, they did it with Odin, you know, they were pagans and then they did it through Christianity. And then, you know, the, the Christian identity movement, Richard Butler, he, he did it all with God. You know, all these guys did it with God. the Phineas priests who are the most violent, violent, um, skins out there, they do it because God told them to do it. They're God's soldiers. Um, so anytime you have the ideology plus the rhetoric and you multiply it times a little bit of religion, you're going to have violence. 
And that's what's so scary. I just want to ask like everybody else, how does this even happen? Like I see my, I see people say, you know, if you have dark skin, you're going to hell. And <laughs> automatically I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. So I, I would like to throw that out to the people at why, why is this happening? Why as humans do we believe this kind of hate would have anything to do with religion, anything to do with Jesus, anything to do with God, which teaches the exact opposite of love. Talk to me about the skinhead intelligence network and what you're up to now. <laughs> well, sin, we, 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 uh, we changed the name. It's now called the supremacist intelligence network because we, we thought that, you know, I mean, we I want to be inclusive. We want to be, yeah, we want to be inclusive. I wore the t-shirt and everybody thinks I'm a skinhead. I'm not, but, uh, you know, what, what it did is started out being a local organization because we wanted to get people together to talk about law enforcement together to talk about the different hate groups or skinheads that are running around and what we found is that hate has no boundaries. And so we're tracking people from California to Florida, to Arizona, to D.C., to Chicago, all over Canada, South America, Italy, Germany, all over the world. And so Tani and I put this organization together and we, we brought experts in from from all over the world. And we talk about hate and we we shut down a lot of organizations and tracked a lot of people. But most importantly, what we've done is been been giving law enforcement the ability to communicate with other guys working the same things they are in different regions of the world so we can now together hate in australia is the same as hate in arizona you know and so we can track all that and we can we can get together and, and meet and look at trends and 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 kind of develop a plan to fight it this podcast is named for the documentary that is about to be released about um, military vets joining extremist organizations. Uh, and one of the surprising things about the success of this film is how incredibly well it has done overseas in Europe in particular. Yeah. Uh, and it's surprising because I, I did not realize how concerned our, our European friends were about what's happening in the mm -hmm. U.S., and yeah. I think your your last answer gets at that. The whole world is looking at at what's happening in the U.S. We are now exporting terrorist ideology, extremist ideology, in a way that other countries used to used to export it. And yeah. extremist groups in places like Germany are drawing inspiration from what's happening here. Can you address? Oh, yeah. Can you address that? Yeah, yeah we've seen that for. Oh, you know, I mean, a we while. got we got a guy that was in Australia. That's actually, I believe, he's in South America now. And he's in, um, I think, Brazil, and he's he's building communities that have the same ideology of basically the government stay out, leave us alone. But he traveled. I mean, he traveled here to the states lots, and then over mm -hmm. into Europe as well. I yeah. mean. He, and he's from Germany originally. He had the, the nationalist mentality and he's going all over the world teaching it. But what, what I found is that, um, we have to talk. We have to communicate. If you, if you don't, I mean, it's like with your podcast. If, if you don't have people talking about your podcast, you're not going to have the, the listeners and viewership that you need to, to keep going. And in law enforcement, it's not just happening here. Like I said, it's, it's everywhere. So, and, and to think that if I were to say, you know, I'm Matt Browning, I know everything there is to know about hate. Well, come on, dude. No, you don't. Because there's a guy in Australia named Jeffrey Steer, who's one of the greatest hate fighters I know. And we talk and we share information. And he tells me, hey, so-and-so is coming to the U.S. And I can call him and say, hey, there's a band coming from the U.S. to Australia. And what they'll do before, as soon as that plane lands... Those guys do not get off the plane and they're shipped back to the United States. They don't allow it there. And so there's things that we can do and, and, and you know, not to the military. The, the problem I have with the guys in the military that are haters is that they have that opportunity to go all around the world and, and, and hook up with people all around the world and talk their hate. We have a guy that was in Florida that would go to the hate, hate band shows all through Germany and Italy because he was stationed there. And we're no different. I got guys that are in Germany that I can call and talk to. So 
All I'm doing is combating what I'm seeing these guys already doing. And what, what you're seeing, I can't wait to watch your documentary. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, yeah, Mar Mar March 29th. Well, don't worry, we'll we will be promoting it heavily uh, on this network. Tony, my my last question is for you, and and I wouldn't even bring it up except you've talked about it on TV and you mentioned it briefly in this interview. How have your kids managed all this and, and are, are they doing okay? Yeah, they're, they're exceptional. I mean, I used to, I had a six year old that would hide a gun under, I mean, not a gun, sorry, a knife underneath his pillow, you know, to protect his mom when his dad was at work. So there were things that were affecting my children in ways that I didn't understand or know. And we talk about it now. And that's one of the reasons that we wrote the book, The Hate Next Door. Matt wanted to write it is for the kids and so that they knew what was happening during all that time. And my, they're good. I mean, some of them couldn't read the, read the book at all and um, other ones read it in a day. But I mean, my kids are doing good and they're doing things that, I mean, cross your fingers and stuff, but they're doing things that are going to change the world. I've got... I've got one that's going to be a pediatrician because he wants to start early. He wants to be able to do intervention early. He thinks that he can change the world by changing the trajectory of a child's life. So, I mean, if that's, if that's the bar that we're going with, I think we're doing okay. Well, that's a, a great uplifting note to end on, Matt and Tawny. Thank you so much for, for your work and for joining us today. Thanks Thank for having you. us. Love this video? Make sure you stay up to date on the latest breaking news and all things Midas by signing up to the Midas Touch newsletter at MidasTouch.com newsletter.